Second generation organic farmer, uh, organic vegetable production, uh, my specialty. Located in the Muskinetcong River Valley, there are local farmers who claim that there are some of the best soils in the country based on corn yields. Anyway, so far one house is fixed. Uh, it was it turned out to be a 1740 house. It took longer. Uh, it took several years, they all run together, but now the focus is finally, <laughs> is finally on production on these 40 acres with only about five acres in production at this point with vegetables and uh, uh, fruit through a wonderful, a wonderful government agency, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, once known as the Soil Conservation Service, came into being during the Dust Bowl years. They have paid for things like cover crop seed, uh, things to do with the water control, erosion control, water conservation, keeping your soil from flowing into the nearby stream, and even things like deer fencing, irrigation system also through this uh, uh, agency. I, I'm, I'm able to put, uh, to irrigate my entire 40 acres. Uh, generally it takes a person per acre to grow organic vegetables, so that would be a staff of you know, quite a few people. The orchard, one of, one of my dreams, peaches have done well actually, which is a bit of a surprise. It may be that the pests and, and diseases haven't found me that the, the nearest peach tree may be far enough from my trees. Anyway, this, uh, this has turned out to be the winter that may confirm in my mind that New Jersey is now a four season <laughs> production. Because everything I have here was uh, picked either today or last week wow. from the field. These are things that can take a freeze. Uh, on, on a night like last night, these leaves will be frozen stiff the sun comes out the next day, this fabric is over it, it warms up under the fabric, and this stuff is fine. Don't ask me how it does it, but, but if, if it can do that, that's why you should eat it, because if it can... <laughs> When you buy peppers in the store and they're not organic, that peel never decomposes in the um, compost operations it's because of what they put on the peels of these peppers. And I used to eat peppers when I was a kid and I loved them, and then all of a sudden, like as an adult, they just kept repeating on me and I never felt good eating peppers. <laughs> um, so now, of course, I'm eating organic pepper. My body's fine with them, but um, Mark grows the most unbelievable peppers. My main trick with peppers is to, is to plant um, more than I would ever think I could use because to, you have to be very patient for peppers to turn those beautiful colors, orange, red, yellow, uh, purple, well, the, the, right, purple. Uh, and, and, and if you only, if you don't have enough pepper plants, you're saying, I need green ones, I need green ones. You, every time you snap off a green one, that's a pepper that's never going to uh, get ripe. In, in, in tropical climates, uh, peppers are perennial, year after year. Bigger and bigger. In organic agriculture, weeds are in fact generally your number one challenge, more so commonly than bugs. Because if you don't have a good fence, your number one challenge is critters. Oh, go ahead. Would you at some point be providing small, you know, starter plants? Seedlings, yes. Yes, at this uh, Flemington market, uh, I do sell seedlings. I have a question. Yes. Would you uh, ever consider having elementary students come to the farm to work a day? Because yeah. I think it would be an awesome yeah. experience for them. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I do it. I do it. My local uh, elementary school, when my daughter was a third grader, uh, the uh, entire third grade class. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was eighty kids in this. Eighty. 
Yeah, and it was, it was, this was the first time I had done it, so I wasn't really up to speed. What, now I have systems. I have systems now. Yeah, they get some lecture, they do some planting, and uh, in the eat lunch, we, maybe we won't do this again. They each got a cup of compost, and I told them my manure spreader was broken. <laughs> Yeah. Two things, we're going to bring honeybee hives to Mark's farm. To the orchard. To the orchard. So as we all know, these uh, fruit trees and most vegetables and uh, food needs to be pollinated. So mon monarch butterflies always pass through Mark's farm and land on his farm. Um, the monarchs are beautiful. Um, we're going to start the honeybees there. And we are also going to start with little chickens. And we're going to have a little chicken coop and a little chicken tractor, maybe. Anybody who comes to the farm wants to see an animal. <laughs> and, and, and I don't, I have, I don't mess with animals much because vegetable production is so consuming. Questions? Um, stink bugs. Are there any problems with them? You know, I'm still trying to figure that one out. I mean, I'm reading about the damage that's going on. Uh, my, my peaches were a little more damaged this year, and somebody was telling me stink bugs. Uh, but I haven't seen, I haven't caught him in the act. <laughs> <laughs> one, one other good thing to do chickens for. You were talking about storing the winter crop. What is the best way to store it? In, in, in a residential situation, if you have a car garage attached to the house, you may, it may be that if the door is closed, that in anything but the single digits, you might have yourself a, a winter storage facility. Okay, so we're going to move on. Thank you, Mark. The other night I called one. How many people are coming to this thing? She said, oh, we're hoping for about 30, but i got to say, you really know how to attract a crowd. I know how to count. <laughs> but uh, my name is Roman Osaka. My wife, Deborah, and I have a large, small family farm you know, in Warren County, right near Sussex border. Uh, I, you know, the reason for the large is we, you know, our farm alone is 150 acres. We also farm on a whole bunch of nearby property. We farm on a 300 acre preserve farm that Nature Conservancy, and on this area we grow hay, and then on, on several other 100 acre tracts we also harvest more hay and we also grow our own cow corn to feed our animals. Um, I mentioned we have a small family farm. Uh, that's because my wife and I do 99% of the work. <laughs> our two older sons, you know, help out just a little bit, you know, whenever we can corral them. Um, you know, I was going to, you know, talk about, you know, garlic or so, but instead of that, I'm going to talk about some more interesting human aspects of eventually ending up to be a farmer. But, uh, you know, our small family farm, just like a lot of farms, and you read about this in magazines and commentaries, how people have to have several jobs off the farm to, you know, enable you to farm. And, uh, and especially when my wife lost her great paying job at m and Mars doing all kind of chocolate research. And every year when I show her you know, the, the schedule F on the farm tech, and it's, and it's huge, you know, huge negative, you know, her answer to me is, but I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when the wife is happy, that's priceless. <laughs> so, you know, over the last 36 years, you know, I've, you know, worked, you know, at a good job to help pay for the farming and everything like that. Um, after we built our house there, and even when we were like, you know, getting serious dating, I was spending a lot of time helping my wife in the big family garden there. But I hated being surrounded by my wife and other gardeners that all know it better than what you're doing it at all. And, uh, and at that time, uh, my best friend's dad, you know, who's from France, you know, uh, gave me for, as a Christmas present one day, you know, like a handful of French shallots called Brittany Red. And he gave them to me to eat or so, but I saved every one and planted them in the garden the following year. And that got me into growing shallots, you know, and uh, I then started growing garlic. This was, you know, all of like, you know, 25 years ago or more. And uh, 
didn't know what kind of variety I was growing, you know, somewhere I got it, uh, but you know, grew it for home consumption and things. Uh, a few years later, I then discovered hardneck garlics, you know, garlic that had a stick coming out of it. So I started, bought some of those, started growing them, and then a few years later, I was at a tomato, you know, convention where they brought in a guy to talk about garlic from Oklahoma. And he's, you know, he's been written up in Newsweek magazine and elsewhere. And he all of a sudden, you know, said, there's about 650 varieties of garlic in the world. And at that time, he had a collection of about 550 of them that he was given to him by the National Seed Savers Exchange to keep alive. And uh, that year he had a couple varieties where he could spare a couple bulbs, so I bought them. They were expensive as all hell, but I grew them and they came out terrific. The following year, I entered them at the state fair, got all the blue prizes and things like that. And at that time, two of us, a guy by the name of Rich Sisti, who has a community-sponsored garden up there, the two of us, you know, you know, one day, you know, talking over some beers, we went, you know, this is the garden state and nobody even talks about garlic. We need to do something about this. So all of a sudden we had an idea, you know, we got to do garlic education at the state fairs. And we would have like 10 different garlics raw sliced up. Person would taste it and right off the bat they would go, boy, this tastes 10 times better than what I get in ShopRite. So we approached the local agricultural extension agents and said, we want to do a garlic festival, you know, for New Jersey. And we chose Lafayette Village. Uh, can you, the state at least put up a circus tent for us so we have a place to put this underneath? So they said, of course we'll do it. So we then started this garlic festival with garlic tasting, garlic education, and it's been a great hit for the last 10 years. Over these many years, I expanded my garlic collection to like about 340 you know, varieties of garlic. Uh, you know, that number has gone up, has gone down. You know, one year I had bought like, you know, 40 rare varieties, you know, at $40 a pound from this one special outfit on the West Coast. Had them planted, you know, in our, in, you know, in like a starter garden near our house. And uh, one night I, you know, come home from work and here now I see all these garlics eaten down. And I go to my wife, you know, and, and, and here's, my wife's, you know, favorite Holstein cow, you know, about 2,000 pounds. <laughs> Carol, <laughs> you know, she's got a garlic leaf hanging out. <laughs> and uh, I, I complained to my wife, and, sh and she's like, oh, darn, I forgot to turn on the electric fence today. <laughs> and she said, but don't worry, the garlic's going to, the, the milk will taste better. <laughs> the kind of garlic I grow is hardneck garlic. And this is, you know, what it looks like, you know, when it's in the ground. There's a two-foot stalk with leaves on each side. Uh, and you know it's a hardneck garlic because it has a stick coming out of it and a single layer of cloves. Um, you know, and this is what it looks like in the ground. After you dig it up, some of them get garlic faces on it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and you know, sometimes they have a good hair day, sometimes a bad hair day, but, uh, but, but they're happy characters. The garlic that's in the stores, you know, 100% of the time is all a soft neck garlic. And then all of a sudden, you know, the bean counters go, hey, you can buy it right at the dock from China for 12 cents a pound on the dock. So we've been importing most of our garlic from China for the last, you know, literally 10 years or so. Um, as far as numbers, the top 10 countries in the world to grow garlic and the United States is like number six, you know, going down. All together grow 12.1 million metric tons. China, which is number one, grows 10.3 of it. India grows about 500,000 tons, you know, but they consume most of it there. Interestingly, number three is the little old country of South Korea. In South Korea, garlic is like almost part of their religion. So this is why America imports an awful lot of garlic, because they can get it cheap and then sell it in all the stores. But the soft neck garlic that's in the stores, it's good, 
uh, but soft neck garlic has you know one third the amount of the sulfur that then creates the natural antibiotic in it which is the illicit so it has like one third the flavor you got to use a lot more and it has like one third you know of the potential medicinal you know benefits to it uh, but you know that's just the story on garlic honey um, here after I built my house, I started landscaping everywhere. Um, but uh, at that time I started planting, I planted about 200 you know, fruit and apple trees, because that's like a Ukrainian thing as well. You know, planted them for a couple of years, didn't get any fruit. You know, so one day I'm talking with this Polish engineer at work and he goes, well the reason you don't have fruit is you don't have honeybees, because all the honeybees that used to be in nature all died off because of the mites that came over here from China. If you want to have fruit, you got to have your own bee. And coincidentally, he goes, I'm a master beekeeper. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I started beehive, you know, a month or two later, my dad comes up from, uh, you know, Trenton to visit. Hey, what's new? And I tell him, hey, I got beehives over here. And that's where I learned the story about how my grandfather, my great-grandfather, his great-grandfather were all like big beekeepers over there. So. You know, how did I get into farming? Well, uh, you know, I married the right woman who had, you know, the land. And then I guess it's also in my genes, you know, from going all the way back. Okay. We're going to say thank you, Roman. Sure. So thank you all for coming.